Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video, a bit of a philosophical one, I'd like to discuss, I suppose, the basic purpose of government and how it would be better, in my opinion at least, from a democratic perspective, if we could diminish its power. You know, this has been brought on by the extremism of our current government, but for a very long time I have questioned why any government needs quite so much executive power. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So uh, I think I've been inspired to commit my thoughts to the power of YouTube on this one. It'll come as no surprise as a result of the latest scandal to draw attention to the abuse and potential abuse that results from the government being able to deploy uh, pressure on an important national institution, an institution that can only really work if it's independent of government. You know, and that is, of course, the spotlight that's been shone on political pressure on the BBC over the last couple of weeks, both from within and without. You know, we need a different culture. And that different culture, I think, has to begin by asking, what do we really need the government to manage? There's no point saying, well, you know, a better government's just around the corner. The Tories will be back at some point and people will have reasonable objections to some things that even a Labour government do. I'm not blind to the fact that any government of whatever party will always seek to spin new stories in the best possible light for them. And inevitably, that means if you put them in a position where they can pressure a broadcaster, they're going to pressure the broadcaster. You know, letting any government have influence over any news media, it's just too much of a temptation. So why do we have a government in the UK? Well, Parliament is the sovereign power, but getting 650 MPs to debate and agree on all of the various aspects of running the country would be onerous. Nothing would be done. So they appoint an executive to carry out much of the day-to-day decision-making while still maintaining oversight over their work via voting. If a majority of MPs is ever unhappy with what the government are doing or not doing, they have the power to intervene because Parliament is superior to the government. The most common way we see this power exercised is in defeating primary legislation during a vote. Uh, in an extreme case, they could even reject a budget. You know, this is an example of Parliament using its power to stop the government doing something. They can also force the government to do something where it was hitherto planning on doing nothing. You know, the Benn Act in 2019 forced Boris Johnson to seek an extension to the Article 50 process if we had not arranged for an exit from the EU with a withdrawal agreement which had parliamentary approval. Johnson had given the impression that he was prepared to leave the EU without any deal at all, so Parliament intervened. But although we do need an executive, does it automatically follow that it should then decide all day-to-day -day matters of running the country? except where Parliament specifically wishes to intervene? I would say no. The problem with the government is, amongst other things, and I mean any government, not just the one we have now, is that it does not represent Parliament or the country. It represents only a majority of MPs in the House of Commons. You can have a government that is set up that has the support of half the MPs plus one. It has no constitutional duty to try, even attempt to represent the whole. You know, it has 100% of the power if it has a majority of half the voting MPs plus one. And with our first past the post system, of course, that doesn't even represent the majority of voters. So what to do? Well, obviously, we need an executive for managing most things. There's no getting away from that. But there are other things which Parliament can still have supremacy over without clogging up their time. You know, there are certain institutions that I feel must be kept distant from government because Parliament does represent the country in its entirety. It represents lots of different political outlooks. The government does not. So obviously Parliament needs oversight, not necessarily the government. And I would say the police, the courts, very topical right now, the BBC, uh, others as well on a smaller scale like the Electoral Commission and other watchdogs. But how do you maintain their independence from government without removing their independence from, from our democratically elected parliament? As they're publicly funded, of course, parliament needs oversight. In fact, it must have oversight. You can't create 
a genuinely independent institution because then how do you allow for accountability? Who watches the watchman? The BBC, ironically, does have an existing model which could work. It's just that it's the wrong body which makes appointments. So the BBC has a board of governors. Where it falls down is it's the prime minister who appoints the board members. The board then make other appointments. So effectively you have not even just the government, not even just this majority of MPs in Parliament, a single person, one person, the Prime Minister, who gets to effectively dictate all appointments in the BBC if they so desire, because they appoint the board members. And if they wish to appoint board members, it doesn't always happen, but if they wish to appoint board members who will be of their way of thinking, then inevitably that means the BBC tends towards their way of thinking. But what if the board were essentially made up of MPs? You could set it up so that no party would have more than a third of the seats. You have a situation whereby a, a third a Labour MPs, a third Conservative, uh, the other a third maybe a mix of other MPs. You could have it so that they get a share of the seats on the board um, according to the size in Parliament, but no more than a third for any one party. You know, and and maybe they all vote for the appointment of a non-political chair for the group, someone with broadcasting experience who would add some expertise to the group. But ultimately, it's MPs that, that control the group. They would then oversee all appointments, all senior appointments within the corporation. You have a maximum of one third of the board that the government could apply political pressure to, which means that the organisation itself would have democratic oversight because it would represent the whole of Parliament and therefore the whole of, of voters in the country. And it wouldn't be especially vulnerable to pressure from a single political party. At a stroke, the BBC is independent of government. Parliament, however, still maintains oversight. You greatly reduce the capacity for corruption. You don't get rid of it altogether. You never get rid of it altogether. But you massively reduce its capacity. You greatly increase the chances that the majority of the board are at least invested in making the BBC succeed. And you make it more difficult for the BBC to be biased. But why would it need to stop there? See, I've often thought that the Home Office should not be such a large, important government department either. There is legislation needed. You do need a Home Office. There is legislation. So the department has a role. But should the government really be involved in day-to-day -day policing? Should they be involved in appointing senior police officers? Obviously, Parliament should, but should the government? I would say no. Why not do something similar? A board of governors with a retired senior officer as the chair along similar lines to that what I've described for the BBC. They then make the appointments of senior officers, such as Met Police Commissioner, but, you know, senior officers throughout the land. Again, the appointments would be political, but not party political, because no one party would have more than a third of the votes. Now, you couldn't do this for all institutions because you'd run out of MPs. See, we need about a third of all MPs to be ministers or shadow ministers. Quite a lot of the rest to run select committees, which scrutinise government departments. So you don't have lots and lots of MPs spare. But you do have enough to set up a few board of governors for selected institutions which must be kept separate from the government. You know, most things don't need to be kept separate from the government, of course. It's just a few things which need, for which government needs to be accountable, not the other way around. You know, you could certainly do it for targeted institutions. The ones where it's really important the government do not exert undue influence. Has to include the police and national crime agency. Can't allow the government to control those who police them. Has to include the BBC, because information's really important. Can't allow the government to corruptly control that. Must include the courts. Now, our courts are independent right now without this system, but the Tories have in recent years been leaning on them and threatening to take away their independence. This ironically means that maybe some judges are avoiding confrontations with the government rather than carrying out their work impartially. You know, for fear of the government removing their independence if they don't behave themselves, as is the case in America. Now, I don't know anything untoward has happened, just to be clear, but the risk exists. And why the risk exists, you, know, you do think maybe sometimes judges will be mindful of government reprisals. 
But if you have a cross-party group to oversee the judicial system, and it was made clear that the government had nothing to do with it, then you ease some of the risk. Of course, the government can always still try to apply pressure via funding. They will still set budgets. But if the institutions are directly accountable to this cross-party group of MPs and they make the appointments, senior appointments, and a majority of these groups can never represent the government, then those efforts would be much less effective. And I think it would work because select committees are comprised of cross-party groups of MPs and they work really well. You know, there's, there's no cat fighting in, in select committees. You know, we can often be distracted by the self-defeating party politi political duels between the front benches of the government and various opposition parties. But select committees tend to function very well. And I think that's probably because they can do their work without a sharp focus from the media, which brings electoral strategy into play. The media, aren't, it's boring. Select committee <laughs> proceedings are boring. Maybe the current privileges committee proceedings are less boring. You know, but committees of cross-party MPs having oversight over certain public institutions need attract little to no more media attention than the ones which scrutinise government departments right now. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.